So, all of you, who is Louis Bonuel? <laughs> yes, I think that's the question we need to start with. But also, just to mention that, I mean, we've, I've been we've been studying Bonuel for so many years, and it's just so amazing to see it in the cinema. I've never seen Viridiana in the cinema. I was always very grateful when, as a kid, that BBC Two and occasionally Channel Four would show these kind of films. Um, I remember seeing my very first Bunuel film, uh, The Exterminating Angel, when I was about 12 or 13. And it was showing on BBC Two on this season they had, and it was on a Friday evening. And I can remember watching it for the first time and just being amazed. It was a really formative experience. Um, so it's wonderful just to say that the Garden Cinema is showing this season of Bunuel films. It really is. And so thanks to you for put putting this together. So yes, the title of the season is Who is Luis Buñuel, which you came up with, and I immediately thought, exactly, that's what this season is about. So I'm going to ask you that question to start with, Peter and Amparo. Who is Luis Buñuel? Well, it's a good question. <clears throat> uh, Buñuel began as somebody who was at um, the uh, university study studying agronomy and um, decided that that really wasn't for him. Grew up um, in Aragon, in Calanda, <clears throat> a little village near Zaragoza. And he was sent to the Jesuit school in, in Zaragoza, uh, which, a school which he was kicked out of, he says, uh, because he was unruly. And <laughs> he was sent back home and went, carried on his schooling <clears throat> in Calanda. Anyway, um, goes to the university eventually in Madrid, uh, where he meets Federico García Lorca, the great poet and dramatist, and also Salvador Dalí. <clears throat> and uh, through their friendship, he becomes more and more interested, not only in writing, I think he began by thinking that he might be a poet like Lorca, and, um, <clears throat> and also began to write uh, reviews of films. He was fascinated by the great German expressionist uh, directors like Murnau and uh, Wiener and, and, and so forth. And um, uh, I'll cut a long story short, he decides that he, his true calling is not actually so much writing about film or writing essays or writing poetry, but actually to make films. And it's thanks to his mother that he makes his first film. Yes, this mm -hmm. is true. Mm -hmm. And so who is, who is Buñuel in Spain? Who is Buñuel for Zaragoza? Uh, Where you're from? Uh, First, sorry for my English. I try to communicate in my in my level of English, but uh, and thank you for Eri Philly, Rob, and and Peter uh, to have the opportunity to be here. And who is Luis Buñuel? When Rob sent me the the question, uh, I realized that I never have uh, uh, thought in in these terms. The the beginning that Peter has introduced is very very <coughs> important because it's the the origin of a person who belongs to the Spanish tradition. You have seen the Spanish tradition, the, the picaresque uh, uh, flow in, in, uh, in the atmosphere of Viridiana. And uh, the Spanish tradition and the avant-garde, the broken up of the avant-garde. And uh, mm -hmm. the result of the mix of these two uh, uh, situation or, or elements uh, that uh, um, um, uh, confluent, um, um, that uh, mix, mix in the mm -hmm in the beginning of the 20th century is the origin of uh, Luis Buñuel, who is uh, a director who writes the beginning, trying to, to, to be a poet, uh, writing a book uh, uh, which uh, title will be uh, Angie Andalou, uh, Un Perro Andaluz. Mm, uh, he decided to write with images, the image that you have seen at the screen, uh, uh, making a variation, doing a variation uh, of the Last Supper mm -hmm. of uh, Leonardo da Vinci, is the way in, in which Buñuel writes with images, with images like the, the, the rape of the triune of rape of, of Viridiana, the two triune of uh, rape of Viridiana, of the the beggars, 
um, is a person who uh, decided that uh, he could change the world um, with uh, broken the established order, mm -hmm. broken the established order through the cinema. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and such, I mean, amazing images throughout his entire cinema. But we could talk for a long time about many of the uh, films by Buñuel, but let's talk about Bolivianna, which has an incre I mean, a fascinating story in how it came to be. Could you give us some idea of the production history of Viridiana? And then I'm going to ask you if you can tell us the problems it had on release with the Spanish censor. So the production history, Peter. Well, uh, Buñuel, of course, uh, had left Spain and spent uh, quite a substantial part of his career in Mexico. He tried to make a career f for himself in America, in Hollywood, but that came to nothing. He, the, he was involved there as a, um, a, a somebody who was dubbing into Spanish films that were made in Hollywood. Um, he tried to find a way of actually making creatively as a director of films in Hollywood. But as I say, that that came to not, not to nothing. He was in Ho he was in America in Hollywood on two occasions, but um, the, the second occasion, uh, eventually he he leaves via the um, Museum of Modern Art, where he also had a had a job there, and finally, through various friends, ends up in Mexico and begins to begins to make films in Mexico. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm taking a long route towards saying something about the reduction of Viridiana because I think it's important to know that that in Mexico he he sort of found himself again after the the the, uh, the, the succeed the scandal of Jean Andalou and um, and Lage d'Or. He repeats that with um, Los Olvidados um, in nineteen in nineteen fifty and. Um, and eventually makes a substantial number of films, some wonderful films uh, like uh, Susana, um, El Bruto, um, El, fantastic films. And then um, he uh, he is called to Spain, if you like, called to Spain by a group of young filmmakers in Spain, Carlos Saura, uh, Luis García Luis Berlanga and and Bardem, three up and coming directors in Spain in the nineteen late nineteen fifties, uh, who uh, thought that if they invited uh, Buñuel to come and make a film in Spain, uh, in under the auspices of their production company, which as you saw is here U N I N C I then uh, that would add prestige to the kinds of films that they were interested in making in Spain, and not just the, the sort of uh, popular pop boilers, comedies, melodramas and so forth, marvelous as those, those are anyway, um, but to give an impetus to the kind of films that they were interested in making. Uh, Carlos Saura's film, Los Golfos, about um, young, young hoodlums, young... Um, uh, young, young um, uh, hooligans in 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 Spain and um, Berdam, uh, Bardem and Berlanga were also making socially conscious films, very interesting films, but with a social conscious. And I think that they felt that, given Buñuel's uh, heritage, given his um, his um, filmography, and given the kinds of films that he was really interested in making, like Los Olvidados, about the dispossessed in um, urban Mexico, that this would be something. Um, to give a boost to filmmaking in that particular direction in Spain. And do actors like Paco Raval and Silvia Pinal, do they, you know, do they understand exactly the kind of film they're getting into at the time? Are they aware of the multiple meanings of the script and how potentially dangerous the film is for their careers? I think they did. I think they, they uh, after all, um, Berlanga was making films which were satirical um, of Spanish society at that time. Films like Bienvenido, Mr. Marshall, <coughs> um, and uh, Bardem with um, um, the, um, what's it called? Cari Mayor, Cari Mayor and, and, and so forth. So I think they were. The point is, the interesting thing here, of course, is Silvia Pinal is, um, the place Viridiana, is Mexican. And um, she is married to uh, the producer of the film, Gustavo Alatriste, had already appeared in a Buñuel film, uh, The Exterminating Angel, and wanted to have this role, even though she's Mexican, um, and not 
not, neither Spanish nor Aragonese, and there's some wonderful Aragonese moments in this film, and when one of the women sings a jota, which is a typical um, kind of um, uh, a song in, um, in, in Aragon. And actually, when, when you hear Buñuel in that opening sequence before the film gets going, you know, the little documentary we had here, that you can, you can just uh, recognize the wonderful Aragonese uh, accent that he has in speaking Spanish. Anyway, just, um, uh, I'm going off, off piste here. Um, yeah. I could listen to you forever. But um, talk about the reception of the film, the problems it had with the censor in Spain. The, the problem uh, uh, came uh, because, um, as uh, Peter has told, um, uh, the film was um, thought like opportunity. Opportunity to Buñuel mm. to come back to Spain. Uh, he wanted to return to Spain because the, um, uh, she didn't feel comfortable in the system of Mexican cinema at the end of the 50s. This is an opportunity to the young directors who wanted to uh, recover a, a leader, a, a master who guide uh, the opportunity to renew the, the Spanish cinema. And it was an opportunity to, to the Francois, Francoism uh, regime to offer a new image of Spain uh, and Spain in which uh, the tourism uh, it's growing and need to to appear more uh, modern and more uh, freedom uh, even uh, be a, a mask and the the scandal uh, created by Viridiana comes from from this because the the, go the Spanish government thought that uh, uh, to recover Buñuel, uh, it was a good strategy. And the end, the strategy uh, um, uh, was a mistake for for them because um, Viridiana uh, win the uh, Palma de Oro, uh, the golden uh, palm in, in Cannes. And three years, th three days later, uh, the L'Osservatore Romano, uh, the journal, the official journal of the Vaticano, uh, did a terrible critic about Viridiana, accusing the film of blasphemy. And uh, do you see? Have you seen? Um, and uh, suddenly, the Spanish regime. Uh, that thought uh, that uh, he has won a position in the international um, uh, international uh, uh, cinema prestige uh, feel that uh, uh, they, they, they they should change uh, their position and decided that the film haven't been producing produced in Spain. Mm -hmm disappear of the list mm -hmm. of the production of Spain. This is the way and in which the government uh, forbid the vision of Viridiana. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the, the history of the reception in Spain, because in the rest of the world, it was a, a great, uh, it has a great success. Mm. Yeah, not just erased from history, but of course, there had already been censorship or interference in the script, hadn't it? Which had led to the great irony of the ending. Could you recount the story of that, Peter? How did yes, Buñuel arrive at the end? <laughs> it's a fantastic ending, isn't it? Because, mm. But actually, before I get to that, if I can just say one last thing, which is that um, Buñuel was sort of um, um, constantly being harassed by the censors. I mean, censorship in Spain was, in, in the cinema, was really very severe. And they, were, they had recommended various changes. And he, he, as far as I can make out, he didn't really, um, uh, except for the ending that Rob has just referred to, and I'll just get back to in a second. But apart from the ending, there were other, other changes that he obviously didn't um, uh, agree to. But the point is <laughs> that the film was sent to Cannes before the censor had a look, 
a, a chance to look at the film. <laughs> so that is why it, it uh, caused such a, a stir when eventually it was, it was, it was screened and, and so on. But the point that Rob's making here about the ending was that um, they objected to the fact that at the end, Viridiana might just go to Jorge's room, and uh, the implication being that she was surrendering and being now submitting to his sexual desire. And uh, that obviously gave Buñuel food for thought, and he thought, well, let's do something else. And okay, she doesn't go to the room to, 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 to be seduced by, by Jorge or to surrender herself to him, instead of which I'll get her to go and in a way, play cards in a ménage à trois. So it's even <laughs> it's even more uh, subversive than than the censors would have wanted. Yeah, and Buñuel was delighted with the ending, yes, wasn't yes, he? Yes, he, yes. he wished he'd thought of it himself, but <laughs> there it is. Stepping back a little from the film, I mean, surrealism is and always has been a very potent weapon against uh, systems and a very strict idea of morality. You know, the Catholic Church, Francoism, fascism. Why is this? Why is surrealism, or why was it? I'm going to ask then after, is it still? But why was it such a potent weapon? What is it about surrealism that's so dangerous? Well, that's a very good question, Rob. I, I don't, I'm not sure that I have the answer to it, but I suppose it's so iconoclastic. It attacks everything. Mm. And um, it, it delves into the unconscious. Right. And, of course, uh, Buñuel's films are so, uh, so, so replete with um, dream imagery, uh, as, as this, film, uh, this film is an example of that. But right the way through his, his, um, uh, his uh, film career, there are these dreams which, as I say, delve into the unconscious. But I think the iconoclasm, you know, the, the, there's, there are no holes barred. Mm. And uh, although, of course, the aesthetics of surrealism are, are interesting in all kinds of ways, because that, that is an assault on c conventional standards in, in, um, in form. Mm. But in addition to that, surrealism has this, and it's certainly in Buñuel, it has a, it has a, 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 a socially conscious element. It has, a, if you like, a political element. And, and Buñuel, as we know, uh, was very uh, much uh, in interested. It, it's a moot point whether he actually did or did not join the Communist Party. Um, early on in his career, but he always had this um, this tendency to, in his films, introduce and and Viridiana is so clearly an example of this um, elements of social and political criticism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, isn't it? It's also I think that the subconscious cannot be controlled, can it? It's the one thing beyond any possible control. Whatever you, they can do to you when you're awake, when you're asleep, your world becomes your own. And so the imagery, the strong images that you're talking about, run free when you're sleeping, when you're dreaming. And there's something uncontrollable about that, I think. Do you think, um, I mean, w was Viridiana understood in its time? What was the audience? Was it a message in a bottle thrown to foreign audiences in Cannes? Or was it a film which was trying to communicate ideas, perhaps through symbolism, through parable, to Spanish audiences. What was the audience and what was the reaction to Veridiana? The reaction uh, in Spain, I have to, we have to, mm -hmm. uh, about it, um, uh, was the end of the producer, uh, the, the, produce, the Spanish producer, not the Mexican producer, a la triste continue producing with Buñuel. And uh, out of Spain, I think that Viridiana um, uh, shocked uh, to the to the public um, because of the images, mm. uh, perhaps. Depending on the the public, Spanish, Hispanic, or no Spanish, Hispanic, or uh, or uh, from another uh, uh, belonging, mm -hmm. um, perhaps didn't know all the all the. Um, the Spanish is Spanish uh, culture mm. uh, um, review and. Um, Puesto en cuestión. Puts in doubt in, in this film. Mm -hmm. 
Eh, eh, I think that el ángel exterminador de, eh, o Simón del desierto o perhaps Nazarín o los, olvidado, los olvidados eh, could, easy, could be easier to understand. But Viridiana is more difficult because the Hispanic essence of Viridiana is, uh, is uh, more deep. Yes. Uh, all the second part of the film is a... Um, a uh, variation about the uh, picaresque, as uh, we mm. said, but it's a variation about uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, but uh, Echave el Viejo, the image with the, the nun uh, prying in front of the tools of the, of the passion, mm -hmm. uh, is a, a literal, uh, a tableau vivant, Uh, of uh, a picture made in the 17th century by a, a, a Spanish painter. And uh, may Goya is there in the, in the old man uh, mm -hmm. eating soap and Velázquez uh, is in the beggar, uh, the Menipo or Uh, the, uh, in mm -hmm. the Museo de Prado. In, uh, the Spanish culture is um, uh, breathing uh, for each images, uh, mm -hmm. image in the film. And I think that it, it's very difficult to, to understand if, if, uh, uh, if the public uh, doesn't know uh, as uh, deep the, the Spanish culture. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean, that leads to the obvious question of, is Buñuel still relevant? What does he have to offer audiences <laughs> today? I mean, I still teach Buñuel. I, I must admit that students can be quite reluctant to engage with the film. I often provide a way in by pointing out the humor, the comedy, the black comedy, the satire <laughs> is often a way in. Now I find that my students react very well to, for example, the representation of the woman in Tristana and in Viridiana and other films, that those female figures become, they, you know, they have new relevance in the current era. But do you think Buñuel is, does he exist in the glass case and his films are stuffy and dusty or do you think they're still relevant? Well, I, I think they're still, I, I think they're still very relevant and, and not only I think to audiences, but also to filmmakers. Uh, yes. There's been a terrific dialogue between Buñuel and other filmmakers. I mean, Buñuel himself, of course, someone, as I've said, who was very interested in um, in the, the German expressionist cinema, in in the um, the the, the, um, uh, the silent comic slapstick comedy of um, Buster Keaton and so forth. So, the humour that you refer to is is certainly very much a, um, an important element of his films. But looking forward, then I think that. Of, in successive generations there's been a dialogue between Buñuel and other filmmakers, most obvious of which in Spanish has been uh, Almodovar, and that he, in a film like uh, Carne Tremula, there's a direct quote from um, the criminal life of Archibaldo de la Cruz, as in one scene you, you see that film being screened on television as something else is going on in the foreground of that film. And an earlier generation, not in Spain now, Uh, but of course, in Spain, people like Carlos Saura and others have continued to, to, as I say, be in dialogue with, with Buñuel. But perhaps um, probably the most famous example is Hitchcock, Alfred Hitchcock. Mm -hmm. And when you think about um, that opening scene, the credit title sequence in one of Hitchcock's greatest films, Vertigo, The, the, the credit title sequence is of an eye being sliced by the, the names of the, t of the, the actors and the, uh, uh, the creative personnel and the director and so forth um, in a way that obviously uh, recalls the, that extraordinary moment in Anshan Andalou. So I think, uh, to answer your question, the, um, in my opinion, audiences, Um, film goers, film enthusiasts, film students uh, have still got a lot to learn from Buñuel in all sorts of ways, uh, not only in f formally, but also from the point of view of his, um, his interests, the questions of desire, of, of sexual desire. I mean, this film is 
so wonderfully um, evocative of the kinds of um, agonies that people suffer through uh, the bondage of desire, if I can put it like that, uh, but also the, the socio-political issues, which he's also very interested in. So film enthusiasts, devotees, students, okay. but also filmmakers, I think there's still a lot to learn from the great man. Yeah. Yeah. I would, one thing struck me while watching it was how sort of timid Saltburn is in comparison. There's a lot of elements which are very similar. You know, it's, it's bringing the poor into the stately house, this kind of thing, and destroying the system from within. But this, you know, Viridiana struck me today as being just still incredibly potent. Is it still, I mean, you, you've mentioned a few filmmakers, like great filmmakers. Do you think it's still an influence on your students, people who want to go on to be filmmakers or artists in Spain? Does it still have that resonance for them? Um, recently, uh, Tarantino, in his memories, uh, has recognized that Buñuel has been fundamental in in his career. Or Lanthimos, uh, we have been uh, speaking about Lanthimos. Lanthimos uh, contains a lot of subjects that uh, became uh, that comes uh, from Buñuel, mm -hmm. the family, the the, the life uh, close uh, uh, itself and uh, Woody Allen mm -hmm. uh, wanted that Buñuel appears in any hall in the moment in which appear um, Marshall McLuhan yes uh, mm -hmm. Castle yeah. McLuhan mm -hmm. first uh, Woody Allen uh, called uh, Buñuel but Buñuel uh, was ill in that in this moment and say and say no and David Lynch the beginning on Blue Velvet mm. for example the the sequence of the of the year uh, uh, in the in the land uh, becomes from Buñuel mm. and uh, especially Almodovar is uh, in Spain but I think that Atomegoyan I ha I had the opportunity to speak with Atomegoyan in San Sebastian uh, once and uh, she told me that uh, Ancien Dalut was uh, his favorite film mm -hmm. it was uh, fundamental uh, for him and if you think if you think in Atomegoyan the uncomfortable sensation mm -hmm. that you uh, uh, feel uh, watching his films uh, comes from from Buñuel. Yeah. Well, I think it is the films themselves remain relevant yes. in what they're showing. Yes. My yes. favorite Buñuel film is The Exterminating Angel. And of course, during lockdown, during COVID, watching a film about people who are trapped in a room and can't leave for months on end <laughs> seems so incredibly prophetic and <laughs> yes. deeply meaningful. Um, so that's an example of, you know, it's my favorite film, but it's also the one that I think has become more and more meaningful to me. Just to in for interest, before we open it up to the audience, what's your favorite Buñuel film, Peter, and, and why? Very difficult. I think I'd have to choose between um, the 1952 L and the 1972 film, The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie. And perhaps I'll finally have to settle for The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie because it's such an extraordinary clever film and especially in the way that it, it uses dream imagery and those dreams within dreams and you know exploring the recesses the inner recesses of human desire but through such a witty way the, the script with Jean-Claude Carrier um, is, is just elegant witty uh, but profound and that's the reason I like that. You surprised me. I was expecting you to say Belle de Jour, which of course <laughs> you're introducing here. Very yes, soon. I am. Well, I like that. Too. And you've written so much on it. Yes. But it's not your favorite. <laughs> well, it's one of my favorites. One of your favorites. <laughs> it's one of your 30 favorites. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How about you, Amparo? Um, it depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, because uh, I adore uh, the sex life of uh, Archivaldo de la Cruz when I wanted uh, want to to see a, a good comedy, a, a good uh, a, a good uh, tell comedy, and I think that Los Olvidados is the is the authentic Buñuel, mm -hmm. uh, the Buñuel who is able to to mix the surrealism with the uh, Hispanic realism, and 
Uh, I like very much uh, Simón del Desierto uh, because is Buñuel thinking uh, about religion when uh, uh, he has decided that the religion is a, a cultural question, but it's a cultural mm. question in which uh, he's very interested uh, on. And um, El. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it depends on the day. It depends on the day. Okay, great. So we are opening officially to the audience. Does anybody want to contribute or have any questions? Hello, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned that Bonoir used a lot of images from his dreams and also his like obsession in life, like the student, the roommate who combs his hair weirdly and stuff like that. Like, how do you go about interpreting all, I guess, analyzing these things because it becomes more like a psychoanalysis or like dream analysis of him as a person. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's very dangerous, actually, to, to be a scholar of Buñuel because the more you analyze his films, the more you reveal of yourself. It's like being shown ink blots and you're saying, oh, well, I think it means this. Well, it means what you think it means. So it's a very dangerous act. The one thing you can do as well, though, is as we see in Viridiana, there are so, there is so much symbolism which can be referred back to existing iconography, such as the iconography of the Catholic Church. So in this film, for example, <coughs> you see the use of the crown of thorns. And the crown of thorns is treated with respect. It's in her suitcase. And at the end of the film, the crown of thorns is thrown on the bonfire, which is a profoundly blasphemous image. But of course, it's not. It's just a branch. <laughs> or is it? So we have those two kind of ways, I think, into Buñuel. One is by referring to existing iconography, which is often about fascism or it's about Catholicism or other very rigid systems which demand a, a, a very strict moral obedience. Or we run the risk of revealing too much of ourselves because essentially, exactly as you say, the, the image is drawn from his subconscious which means something perhaps for him, but also means something for us, depending on our subconscious response too. So it's between the two things. It's a bit of a negotiation. Would you agree with that? Or you've written more on Buñuel than no, anybody, I no, think. No, I, I, I go, along, go, go along with that, yes. I mean, uh, this, this, the, the film is packed with that kind of imagery, isn't it? I mean, the, the, ro you know, the skipping rope, but it's quite obvious that the skipping rope is not just a skipping rope. It's not only the thing that, that uh, he uses, that, um, that um, Fernando Rey uses to hang himself with, but what is he hanging himself with? He's hanging himself on um, the, 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 he's on the rack of human sexual desire. He can't control it. This is a man who is not only in mourning for his dead wife, but somebody who is, um, to use the, the Freudian thing, in, in a state of melancholia. Um, what is this melancholy? It is a kind of self-hatred as well, which he, which he um, suffers from, and the, therefore the 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 skipping rope with its obviously um, um, phallic imagery is something that tells us about the fact that this man is tormented by these by these um, uh, needs, desires, yearnings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Buñuel also sets traps for people. If you've seen Tristana, uh, the character of Tristana entertains herself by always choosing between between two things such as she chooses between two streets she chooses between two chickpeas which one to eat of course the choices she makes are meaningless and but the chickpeas are identical the streets are identical so Buñuel is playing with the audience too he's setting up you know he's setting up symbols he's setting up he's giving them prominence such as the leg the prosthetic leg in Tristana and inviting us to interpret our meanings um, some of which we probably would best keep to ourselves, I imagine. Yes, I think that uh, I I agree with both with you. And I added that it's very important to understand not the meaning that Buñuel wanted to, uh, to incorporate with this image. Uh, it's uh, more interesting, perhaps, uh, to know the genealogy of this uh, image. Uh, then the interpretation of the of the public is is free, like Buñuel want want, uh, but the origin is uh, passionate, 
because um, reveals all the saucers in which uh, uh, he researched to create this um, uh, kind of uh, images so potent. Just on, on that, uh, if I can just say one small anecdote. The self-referentiality of, of Buñuel, the endlessly coming up with his, his perennial obsessions. If you've seen that obscure object of desire in that film, people, lots of people go around carrying uh, stuff in, in, in sacks. And there are all kinds of ways in which one can, can read that. What are we, we're carrying along, we're carrying with us our hang-ups, if you like. Well, one of the beggars here carries a sack. So it, it's, it's, you know, it's uh, 20 years earlier, he's, or 20 years later, and the obscure object was, uh, he's still using the same imagery. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for these fascinating comments. Um, I was struck watching Viridiana um, by its Gothic aspect. And I think there's quite a tradition, actually it's a tradition that kind of crosses from the UK to Spain from a production perspective with people like Christopher Lee making films in Spain that are horror films. Can you, and this is a bit of a, a difficult question, but can you place Bunuel in some way in relation to the Gothic in Spanish culture, Spanish literature? The Gothic Spanish literature, uh, literature uh, was very poor, um, uh, but it's very interesting your question because after this film, uh, the terror uh, film in Spain and in TV and cinema uh, appear suddenly when we haven't any tradition in this kind of production. Um, the real origin of, uh, of this, of this history is Pérez Galdós, uh, Alma, a, a novel that is a, um, the second part of Nazarín, a film that uh, I think that you have seen in this, in this cycle. And Alma is the, is the origin of, uh, of this history that is a mix between, uh, a play, uh, written by, um, Julio Alejandro, the co-writer, the co, uh, the, the author with Buñuel of the script, and uh, uh, Federico García Lorca y La Casa de Bernarda Alba. Uh, uh, perhaps La Casa de Bernarda Alba uh, uh, has something gothic, but uh, I don't know. It's a very difficult uh, question that perhaps uh, Peter uh, could uh, answer better than me. Uh, my reference are uh, Pérez Galdós, uh, essentially. I think that's a fascinating question. Buñuel, I think, was um, very interested in, in the Gothic. Uh, and uh, if I can just sort of point to three directions. One, he, um, of course, worked with Jean Epstein in a very um, minimal way in the house of uh, the, the fall of the House of Usher. Uh, he, that's one one thing. So he's he, he's interested in, in in that. And in fact, uh, secondly, if you consider the house in Viridiana as being a kind of um, equivalent of the house in Psycho, as I was making connections with with Hitchcock. Uh, it is more of a gothic house during the ownership of Fernando Rey, isn't it? With its gloomy shadows and uh, um, restricted spaces and uh, inner frames and so on. <clears throat> and thirdly, Buñuel himself says, you know, he, he, loved, he loved the gothic. If you read um, Mi Ultimo Suspiro, um, he talks about that. He, he, he refers to some of the, the great um, uh, works in English. Um, Matthew Lewis is the monk, which he wrote a screenplay for, uh, but never got around to directing. And it was eventually directed by Edo Kiru. Um, but also some of the texts which were 
uh, of interest to the Surrealist movement, and perhaps above all, the most sacred of these texts, was Wuthering Heights. Now, Wuthering Heights has ele Gothic elements, of course, and uh, Buñuel wanted to make Wuthering Heights, cum which uh, Spanish, Cumbres Borrascosas, um, in the 19, you know, 1920s, 1930s, it never, it never happened. But he did make it eventually in 1953 in Mexico, and where the whole of the Yorkshire scenario and mise-en-scene was transported to, to Mexico. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an absolutely wonderful film in all kinds of ways, especially the, the ending. So those are the three strands that I think I, I would point to. Um, uh, and uh, in in Spain, uh, as as Amparo was saying, eventually there was a, a sort of a flurry of uh, horror films, Jesus Franco and various other popular films. But um, you can detect Gothic elements not only in Galdós. I quite agree with Amparo, but perhaps also in some of the nineteenth century, other nineteenth century novelists like Emilia Pardo Bazán, uh, who in a way wrote novels set in Galicia in northwestern Spain, which to some extent resemble the kind of things that um, that uh, Emily Bronte was doing in, in Wuthering Heights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can see the prolongation, I think, in other recent horror from Spain, like the others, like the orphanage, which, you know, they continue with this theme of the woman and, you know, the country mansion, this kind of thing, and the, the dynamic that goes on within them. Sorry, you're going to say? No, no, no. Um, uh, the the answer of the Peter was has been wonderful. The the references of Abismos de Pasión, Gunthering uh, Gathering Heights, uh, is fundamental. And another uh, um, hearing you, um, uh, I have remember uh, that the the first title of um, the Exterminator Angel was. Uh, de Náufragos de la mm -hmm. calle Providencia, Providence. I would and translate that. Yes. No, um, Náufragos. Shipwreck. Shipwreck. The shipwreck, shipwreck of, of the house the, of the. What was it? I think. Uh, Providencia. Uh, Providence. Prov yeah. Shipwreck uh, on Providence Street. Yeah. Yes. Sounds good. Yes. And uh, uh, Providence uh, is the city of Edgar Allan Poe. If I don't. Edgar Allan Poe. Okay. Graham Poe, and he was obsessed with Poe. And uh, in fact, in uh, 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 the Exterminator Angel, uh, uh, there is a um, magic uh, invocation, demoniac invocation, in the middle of a, of a very uh, dark night. Then uh, all this gothic uh, question that you have perceived, uh, perhaps uh, could uh, relate it with, with all of this. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question about um, this movie. You said that it's a clear depiction of surrealism, but I personally believe that it's more about realism, about the rural uh, culture of Spain. So I just want to get your perspective on that. Like, how do you define that you can see the, the surrealism here? Um. So how do you identify or define surrealism in Bolivia? Ah, well, I think primarily um, it's about, um, well, if, if we say the surrealism in Buñuel's um, uh, uh, um, affiliation to it, if I put it like that, is a mixture of, uh, of form and also of content. So from the point of view of form, um, is this a, a surrealist form? Is it uh, something that... Um, that uh, um, breaks away from realist modes, probably not as much as you would say is the case in Belle de Jour or in uh, Jean Andalou, obviously, um, or in um, um, the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie or La Voie Lactée. It possibly doesn't have that same um, uh, iconoclasm vis-à-vis -vis the form of the of the film, but nevertheless, it, it does. Um, it does. Um, have the the further element of the interest of the surrealist in the world of the unconscious and if we think about 
the unconscious, then surely all those dream sequences, not only the dreams that Rita talks about, the, 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 the bull that's entering her, her, her room, but also the, uh, the somnambulism of, of Viridiana, um, that leads you into all of these issues about, about the unconscious and that they're then related to aren't they? The, what we were talking about before, the ways in which certain objects are set up for uh, readings that may, that may be surrealistic. I think there's a th distinction as well in surrealism between, it's an important one, between latent meaning and manifest. And something which is latent is something which is suggested, it's insinuated. Um, it's a description of a dream that we don't see. And this is the kind of thing which should trigger the subconscious thoughts of the audience. When surrealist imagery, if it is surrealist imagery, is made manifest, when it's obvious, when it's a very clear kind of fantastical sequence, say in the films of Wes Anderson, it's, le it's not surrealist because it's manifest, so it's lost its power. Because it's been made obvious, it doesn't insinuate anything, it simply exists. It's an image which, you know, you have, may have an emotional response in some way, but you don't have a subconscious one to it. So the latent imagery of Buñuel is all about drawing something out, drawing out your fears, your desires, all of those things which, you know, you, you, you may want to keep hidden. Buñuel wants to bring them out. He wants, this is why he uses things like black comedy. He uses symbolism, which provokes the audience. He's an agitator. And... Um, this is one of the reasons that he had, you know, surrealism is so often connected with revolution as well. The filmmakers, surrealism and revolution tend to work together because they, they draw out this idea that we're all becoming automatons or we do what we're told, but to trigger our subconscious triggers something much more. And I think this is what, you know, this is what the, the film Viridiana uh, is about as well. It's triggering something in the characters, but also in the audience too. And um, sorry. Should I give the mic? Sure. Oh, or do you want to oh, say okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, um, um, being a purist, um, only the ancient Andalou uh, mm. Lash Door uh, mm. are uh, surrealist films uh, because of the, the creative process, uh, mm. because they use uh, the automatism, uh, the uh, uh, the automatic the automatism writing, and the the rest of the, oh, the rest of the production of Luis Buñuel uh, is um, marked by the surrealism in the way that you have uh, say, but no, uh, uh, it is a surrealist film. Um, but uh, they use uh, the uh, the images uh, like a provocation in order to um, to awake uh, uh, our uh, uh, subconscious, mm. uh, and um, in, it's very important to understand Viridiana like a film in which this kind of uh, surrealism uh, filtered by the, uh, the Second uh, World War uh, mm -hmm. and the, the Mexican experience and uh, 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 mixed with uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish realism. Uh, this is one of the mm, the best thing in in the case of Viridiana, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I just wanted to go back to the framing question: Who was Luis Buñuel? And um, also the earlier discussion about favorite films. Um, I actually think one of Buñuel's greatest creations is his autobiography, "My Last Sigh, My Last sure. Breath." Uh, I'm not sure it answers the question of who was Buñuel, but um, I just think it's one of the greatest uh, filmmakers' autobiographies, and I wondered if the panel shared my opinion. Absolutely, it's um, it's one of the greatest books, probably my favourite book of all time, and I have a copy that I bought straight after seeing the, the Exterminating Angel when I must have been about twelve or thirteen, <laughs> which is held together with sellotape. It's an ancient version now. It's utterly wonderful, and it's totally untrustworthy. 
And it, like his best films, he's playing with the reader just as he plays with the audience. And I l love it so much. And it was a truly inspirational book. And it's probably the book that made me want to study film. So yeah, I totally agree with you on every, on every level. But it's a, it's a book, uh, plenty of uh, uh, liars. Uh, <laughs> because uh, Buñuel adore uh, to play with the, the public and to lie to the public. And uh, he did like uh, most of us uh, do, uh, build a image of ourselves, uh, the, the image that the, we want the people uh, have uh, of uh, of us uh, in in this book buñuel uh, adores to 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 say that he improvised for example the sequence of the last supper it's a liar yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the script uh, he draw in the script the uh, position of each of the beggars and but uh, it's a pact of fiction yeah. uh, with uh, with Luis Buñuel um, and uh, it's part of the admiration that uh, Jean-Claude Carrière mm -hmm. uh, uh, had uh, uh, about Buñuel uh, Carrière uh, consider uh, Buñuel considers Buñuel uh, his master mm -hmm. and there is a lot of um, uh, of career in my my last breath. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> um, but as playful as the book is, and as full as full of lies as it is, it's also incredibly profound. His philosophy comes through, and if you do read it, Buñuel's writings on the meaning of memory, his writings on the meaning of love, are absolutely wonderful. They're extraordinary. Uh, it's just one of the greatest books I've ever written. Yeah. The beginning, the when uh, he uh, write about the memory, mm -hmm. I think that yeah. is the best the best part of the book yes. because it's a declaration of intention mm -hmm. intentions. Uh, uh, he's uh, built uh, uh, his history like uh, he would like to be mm -hmm. probably. I think the. Uh, one of the things that comes through in that in that book is his not only his humor but his humanity. Um, Buñuel is a, uh, a really kind person, but despite all the the the, uh, the, uh, the aggression of some of the the imagery, I think there's a extraordinary humanity there. But as to the humor, I mean, even when he's talking about serious things, such as for example, he calls the Marquis de Sade his uh, his master. Um, and of course, he's also indebted to Freud in all kinds of ways. But as to the, we haven't talked about Saad. So he talks about the, the, the Marquis de Saad as, as his master. But when you see um, the, the Marquis appearing in his films, either by indirectly or directly, as when he turns up in uh, L'Age d'Or or in um, Belle de Jour, in the guise of Monsieur um, Michel Piccoli, it, it's done with humour, uh, and and I think that's something not to be underestimated. Buñuel's great sense of humour um, throughout the films. One more question. I have one. Um, I just watching Veridiana and watching Simon of the Desert. I was. I mean, he says he's an atheist and he hates Catholic Church, but I see a sort of empathy at the same time and understanding. I mean, Viridiana in the film is so dignified and you are rooting for her. So is there an ambiguity towards there from Bonuel, like his position, his disposition with religion or? Bonuel has a sentence very, very mm, uh, Interesting that says, "Soy ateo gracias a Dios." I am uh, atheist. I'm, uh, I'm thanks, still an atheist. Uh, thanks to God. Thanks, thanks to God. God. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he uh, said in uh, in uh, the last breath that uh, he uh, uh, didn't believe uh, science uh, fifty. I think when uh, he and the, the the scholar uh, studies. But the Catholic uh, culture and the 
and the liturgy uh, uh, is part of uh, of his uh, um, of of his education, of his um, perception of the world, even in, in sometimes uh, the irony in which uh, uh, he uh, uh, speaks about the the religion in Viridiana, for example. Uh, is part of the Catholic culture. To make jokes about the church is very common uh, because we can uh, confess uh, after to do the, <laughs> uh, the joke. Then uh, 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 it's, very, it's very important uh, and it, it's uh, uh, absolutely uh, um, imprescindible. Essential. Essential, uh, essential to to read Buñuel from this uh, contradiction that you have uh, comment. Yeah. Uh, Just to say that, uh, comment on that. Sorry. Very it's, it's last week or last couple of weeks. Again, it's from the um, my last breath. But um, I think he's. I think the only person he wanted to speak to was a Catholic priest, wasn't yes, it? And that was the only friend. person he could speak mm -hmm. to, and then. I think so. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Which is quite interesting when he's famous at the end. He's thank God. I think it's what Peter said as well. I think it's the, the great humanity of Buñuel that he sees these people who are devout and they're living their lives according to Catholic dogma and he feels great compassion for them. But he also thinks they're idiots. The great line for me in Viridiana, which always makes me laugh, is when she's taking the beggars into the house and one woman says to the other, oh, she's so good. She's a bit loopy. <laughs> it's, you know, chalada, I think, is the word. Yeah. And I think that is kind of like Bonuel's kind of response to religion. You know, he sees people becoming devout and following their lives and living their lives according to this. He feels great compassion for them because, really, what are they doing? They belong to a cult. <laughs> and at the end, uh, he always rescued the person, mm. the human being. Yeah. Nazarin at the end, and Viridiana. Viridiana comes from God to the human mm -hmm. uh, for uh, his cousin. Yeah, she's forced out of the nunnery into <laughs> real life. <laughs> into real life. Yeah. Yes. That's it. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we're at the end of the discussion. A big thank you to Rope, Amparo, and Peter. Big round of applause. Thanks very much.